السلام عليك زين الأنبياء السلام على بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافي مزيده ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمة الله عدد ما في علم الله صلاة وسلاما دائمين بدوام ملك الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala barakatuh, everyone. And mashallah, and a, and a nice, beautiful, brisk, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, where Or crisp, rather. Good morning to all of you. Uh, and alhamdulillah, I was just telling Mukhtar, the coordinator for the weekend retreats, you know, how wonderful it feels to feel the energy of people here and the people sincerely seeking knowledge. And... Uh, a thought came to my mind this morning because usually Friday night has the smallest number of people are usually able to make it on Friday night and then people are traveling and tired and so forth. So then praying together, uh, praying Fajr together the following morning can be uh, a little bit difficult for people, especially after a travel and a long day at work and so forth. But then it was so beautiful to see so many people here before Fajr and people making dua, and we prayed Fajr and congregation together. And the thought came to my mind, I said, if, if, if us as Muslims, if we did this on a regular basis, if the lines were full for Fajr on a regular basis, and we're calling upon Allah saying, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, then things will change. That's the, the people who do that, they are an honored people. They are a noble people, and nobody in the world can uh, take that away from them. When, when we live up to these principles and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, and inshallah while we're here, we should really make an effort to immediately implement everything we're learning in the upcoming prayer, whatever prayer it is. So the next prayer will be Salatul Dhuhr, and then what we learn between Dhuhr and Asr, we put it into practice for Salatul Asr, and so on and so forth. And then there were beautiful reflections this morning when Shaykh Yahya was talking about uh, a statement that, inshallah, uh, we'll cover today of Hatim al-Asam and how we can really properly uh, have the right frame of mind and understanding and use our imagination in the right way so that when we enter the prayer, we have presence of heart. And people were reflecting upon that and that was really uh, valuable and insightful. Uh, and another beautiful sort of reflection that, or thought that came to my mind is, you know, this is a sign of people who are seeking knowledge for the Akhirah. This is what Imam al-Ghazali is talking about. Ilm, suluk, tariq al-Akhirah. You know, knowledge that takes you on the path to the hereafter. So people who are wanting to improve their prayer, learning about the salah, and then the following morning they're there for Salatul Fajr. And for those who are unable to, then inshallah, for the rest of the prayers, some people have families and we're traveling and young children. It's very understandable, but it was really beautiful to see, uh, you know, such large numbers at a time where usually it's the smallest numbers, but uh, that was really beautiful. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accept from us and that he increase all of you and bless all of you uh, because it's through your intentions and your efforts and your uh, sincerely seeking knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives uh, us the opportunity to read these books and to learn and to uh, uh, be in a position of service. So we all thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'd also like to thank all of you for your sacrifices, for your commitment, for the time and the effort that you are uh, uh, giving in order to seek sacred knowledge. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept from all of us. So just as a recap of what we covered yesterday, so the two opening sessions yesterday focused on the merit of prayer, part one, 
uh, and we looked at the merit of the obligatory prayers, and we looked at the merit of the congregational prayers in jama'ah, and then also the merit of prayer in the masjid, in the mosque. So we looked at those sections that Imam al-Ghazali mentions those things, and Sheikh Yahya then in session two uh, talked about the outward dimension of prayer, which is very important. And he also uh, talked about how the outward and the inward, they're not really separate. They're like two sides of the same coin. And it's unfair to really try to make them uh, exclusive from one another, but they're actually very much connected, that through the sharia, through the outward sacred law, we access the haqiqa, the inward realities. So uh, he focused uh, uh, on the outward aspects of the prayer, starting from before the prayer, the adhan, takbiratul ihram, you know, the adhkar and the duas that we do before we enter into the prayer, the movements of the prayer, the fatiha, and the importance of practicing and uh, striving to recite the fatiha properly, which is the surah in the Quran that contains the meanings of every other surah in the Qur'an, you know, bowing properly, uh, rising from that, uh, going into prostration, even things as uh, uh, seemingly simple as where we, how far our fingers are apart and so forth. And if you look at that, that it's coming from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wasallam, and part of our realization of our ubudiyah, our servitude to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is following the sunnah of his messenger. We also realize, in addition to that primary principle, that there are immense wisdoms and benefits that come in even what might seem to some people's minds like a small detail. Is it really that important? If the Imam al-Mursaleen, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Imam of all the prophets and messengers did it, then it's very important where he placed his thumb. Was it like this? Was it like this? How did he do the tashahud? All of those things are uh, extremely valuable. And if just by extension, if you think about something relatively worldly, has health benefits, but if you even think about stretching or exercises, your form, the smallest movement can make a big difference. That's just a physical thing. You know, if you're, if you're doing, for example, like a push-up, where your hands are and kind of how you, it will have this great impact on which muscles are targeted or if you're stretching in a particular way, you have to make sure that this particular muscle is being stretched and you're not doing it in the wrong way. If we have that kind of consideration for things that have physical benefits, then when we follow the sunnah of Allah's messenger, salawatullahi wa salam alayhi, even those outward aspects, we should take into consideration. And one small thing, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, it's really important for all of us, as Shaykh Yahya was saying yesterday, that when we are in the salah, that we ensure that our awrah is always covered. Outside of the salah, but especially in the salah. And this applies to both men and women. And I'll actually direct just a very small piece of advice to my, my brothers. You know, uh, sometimes in sujood, our t-shirt or our shirt can kind of go up and our awrah can be uncovered or our pants might be a little low, we have to be really careful about that. That we should have clothing that is really suitable for us in all aspects of life. You can still dress however you need to dress to work, but making sure that, for example, we have extra long undershirts, or that we're wearing a belt, or that we're covering ourselves so that uh, uh, we maintain the sanctity of the salah and we don't invalidate it, and we also maintain our dignity uh, uh, in that way, and the same applies to women in making sure that their awra is covered, especially in the salah. Just something to keep in mind because it's widespread. It's widespread that sometimes people might dress a certain way and then they don't realize that in sujood, it will compromise the, the actual validity of the salah in addition to be, being unpleasant uh, for all around them. I'll leave it at that. MashaAllah. So then Shaykh Yahya was talking about all of these things related to the outward dimension of the salah. Today, the majority of what we're going to focus on today are the inward aspects of the salah. So in this session, we're going to look at the merit of prayer part two, focusing on some of the more spiritual elements of sujood, of khushu' 
of having this reverence and presence of heart. <clears throat> and then Sheikh Yahya, in his next session, he's going to look at the six sort of almost, you could look at them as levels of understanding or uh, uh, things that should be present in the heart during the prayer, inshallah ta'ala. And then we'll look at some of the ways to instill presence of the heart, how to have hudur in the salah. And then Sheikh Yahya, and this I think will be really, really, really beneficial. If, for example, you have other responsibilities, you have a work meeting, you have other things to do, uh, session six is, is something that we shouldn't miss. And if you're watching this later, really making sure to go through everything. Every session is very important, but session six is really beautiful. That section that Imam al-Ghazali talks about on the inward aspects of the prayer, what should come to heart in every uh, element of the salah is very valuable, very valuable. And inshallah, it will be transformative. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. That is our goal and hope. Uh, and those are the sessions uh, for today. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. So to begin, we're going to look at fadilatu sujood, the merit of prostration. And this is beautiful. Imam al-Ghazali radiallahu anhu uh, really does a masterful, is masterful in his explanation, but it also shows us just the beauty of this deen. And as was said yesterday, we should look at all of these things as ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, given us his favors and his blessings and his gifts. That the salah is something the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa loved dearly. And whenever he was challenged with something, he would rise to prayer. And when he would tell Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu to make the adhan, he would say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Come for us with the adhan, O Bilal, because they love the salah. Another thing I always think about all the time, they didn't have alarm clocks. The Sahaba would pray Qiyam al-Layl regularly, the vast majority of them. If not all of them, I don't know. They would pray Qiyam al-Layl regularly. How did they do that? Their hearts were so attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were so immersed in love that they yearned for the salah. They loved the salah. And there's many stories. I'll tell you one, one amazing story about the khushur of the Sahaba. And we're kind of jumping a little bit ahead. But it's a really beautiful story. That there were two Sahaba after one of the battles. And they were guarding the, the, the border, the frontier. You know, from any attacks that might have come from the disbelievers. So it was nighttime. They said, we're going to guard the frontier. And there was two of them. So they said, okay, you go to sleep for the first part of the night. And I'll pray and watch the border. And then uh, uh, when I'm done, you can take your watch and we'll switch off. So the first Sahabi, he begins <clears throat> uh, praying and the other Sahabi goes to sleep. And he's able to see if people are coming. So he's in his salah. And then there was a disbeliever who wanted to attack. So he came from a distance and he put out his bow and arrow and he shot the Sahabi. But he hit him in a place that wasn't uh, a very, uh, particularly a mortal wound. But he hit him with an arrow. Like he got shot with an arrow. The Sahabi continues praying. The guy takes another arrow. <laughs> hits him a second time. He continues praying. Till the blood starts to flow and it wakes up that other Sahabi and then he sees the guy and scares him off and he runs away. Afterwards, he... He tells his friend, the, the companion, he says, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you wake me up? Why didn't you tell me there's someone attacking you? He said, I was enjoying the recitation of Surah Al-Kahf in my salah so much that I didn't want to interrupt it for this disbeliever. What kind of, what kind of state is that? Like you're, getting, you're literally getting shot with arrows. And obviously this is a very high level. A very high level, but that just shows how much they love the salah. It wasn't something in his mind, no, no, I have to keep on praying. He's like, no, I could break my salah. That's a valid reason to fight this prayer. But for him, nah. Alhamdulillah, anzala ala abdihin He's just in the ocean of the Quran and in the presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Break it for him, that's no, not worth it. I'm not going to die from this, so it's not that big of a deal. And then the other Sahabi woke up eventually and chased him away. 
That was their state. We need to love the salah. We need to teach ourselves to yearn for the salah. To really see, as Imam al-Ghazali said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unlike the rulers of this world where you have to go through so many layers of red tape just to see someone and even get a letter to them and just a small request or whatever it may be. And that person isn't really going to do a whole lot for you anyway. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifts the veil and opens the door at any time if you want to be in his presence, Jalla Jalalu. Naam. So now we'll look at, inshallah, Fadilat al-Sujood. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم ما تقرب العبد إلى الله عز وجل بشيء أفضل من سجود خفي. It's a beautiful hadith narrated by Ibn al-Mubarak that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said a servant draws closer to Allah mighty and majestic with nothing more virtuous or meritorious than a very inconspicuous sujood. A hidden sujood. Nobody has to be around to see it. But a person goes into sujood. You can pray in your room. You can pray in your office. You can pray anywhere that's clean. Nobody has to be around. And many of the salihin, like Imam al-Junaid, radiallahu anhu, Imam Abu Hanifa, they were people who would sell and they were in the marketplace and they would have a musalla in their shop. Before even opening up the shop, they would do how many dozens of raka'at. Then they would open up their store. You can pray anywhere. Make, you know, as, as one of the, the sayings we looked at yesterday, yesterday, is wherever you pray, it's a witness for you. And the world adorns itself. That piece of earth that you pray on adorns itself for the one who prays. Right, so take advantage of that. So ma taqarrab al-abdu ila Allah. A servant draws closer to Allah with nothing more meritorious than a very hidden, inconspicuous sujood. And he also said, Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, ma min muslimin yasjudu lillahi sajdatan illa rafa'ahu allahu biha darajah wa hatta anhu biha sayyi'ah. Whenever a Muslim prostrates for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even one prostration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that prostration elevates him one degree and removes one sin from that person. Uh, it's narrated, and this is one of my favorite hadith ever. This is a hadith that's narrated by Imam Muslim. The Sahih hadith. It's, it's a, there's so many, there's so many, I'm just going to keep it focused on the salah. There's so many things that you can talk about with this hadith. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for a while he had guards who would be like bodyguards, security. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse that we are protecting you. Wallahu ya'asumuka minan nas. That we, Allah, will protect you from people. So then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told the people who would come to guard him and protect him, you all can leave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised me directly from him that he will protect me. So most of them said, okay, yeah, and if that's your command, O Messenger of Allah, and they went their way. There was one of the Sahaba, his name was Rabi'a ibn Ka'b al-Aslami. He stayed around. He was one of the people guarding the Prophet and Prophet said, everyone, you can go, it's over. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, uh, you know, given me sufficiency. We, don't, we no longer need this. So he stayed. And it was late at night. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told him, he said, didn't I tell you Allah is protecting me? You don't have to be here anymore. He said, Rasulullah, I'm not here to protect you. I'm here if you need anything, any service I can do for you. I just want to be here that if you have a need, I can fulfill it for you. I just want to do khidmah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he brought him his wudu water. This Sahabi Rabi' ibn Ka'b, he brought him his wudu water. And think about this. For anyone who's met some of the awliya, these very select righteous servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you realize that they go through what is called ahwal, these different states. And sometimes they have a hal that you, you really can feel like the door is open. Like a Sayyidah Aisha, she noticed that sometimes with the Prophet and she would ask him for dua. She realized that the Prophet was in a particular state with Allah that he would give great things. So the Prophet it really seems Allah knows best that he was in that kind of hal with this sahabi. So it's the middle of the night. Nobody else is around. 
And the Prophet is making wudu to stand in salah. So then he says to this Sahabi, Sal, ask. And he leaves it open ended. What does that mean? Ask whatever you want to ask for. It's on you because your aspirations cannot surpass Allah's giving. So this Sahabi, radiallahu anhu wa arda, was very intelligent. He said, As'aluka murafaqataka fil jannah. I ask you, O Prophet, for your company to be in your company in paradise. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he said, anything else? And he says, huwa dhaak. That's it. That's everything. And the Prophet وسلم, he gives him a formula for all of us to take into consideration when we're talking about the merit of sujood. He said, وسلم, Assist me against your own nafs with abundant sujood. In other words, the condition in order to be granted that is that you make abundant sujood, you feel, fulfill your part of the agreement, and I promise you what you ask for. So if we want murafaqat al Nabi Sallallahu that's one of the greatest, that's the greatest thing. If we really want to be honest, that's the greatest thing you can ask for, is to be in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in paradise. The paradise for paradise, the joy for Jannah is the Prophet ﷺ. That he resigns in paradise is, is the gift for Jannah. So the way that we do that is abundant sujood. That we realize our ubudiyah lillah. That we really put forward an effort to actualize our servitude. And part of our intention is that we reach a degree of nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we fulfill this agreement with the Messenger of Allah Even though we're 1400 years later, we say, O oh, Messenger of Allah, if you give us the opportunity to ask, we ask you for murafaqataka fil jannah. We want to be with you in paradise. So we follow uh, his advice for us, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. A'inni ala nafsika bi kathratis sujood. Naam. La ilaha illallah. وقيل إن أقرب ما يكون العبد من الله تعالى أن يكون ساجدا. Another hadith states that the closest a servant is to Allah the Exalted is when that servant is in sujood. And this is a proof that it's not a distance and place and all of those kinds of things that people get uh, caught up on. No, that it is a, a distance and nearness that is spiritual. And when you take this most noble part of your body, your face, and you know the thing that we put so much thought and effort into other people seeing, what kind of glasses am I going to get? You know, do I have lotion? Have I, you know, cleaned myself up and so forth? People put a lot of thought into how others are going to see them. This very noble part of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's gift of how He created us that we put this on the earth at the lowest level, all the way down for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So in return, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the greatest level of nearness in that moment. You want to be close to Allah. If you feel, and here's the thing is that I think especially, I'm so happy to see people, alhamdulillah. But you know, like people were lo like really lonely during COVID and feeling isolated. And that's real. If you ever feel that estrangement, if you ever feel alienation and alone and feeling like I'm not close to anyone and going through those difficulties, we have to find our comfort in the salah. I'm not saying that there aren't other things that help, obviously. It's so beautiful to be together. Those things help. You know, the company of other people, we are social beings. We are meant to be, you know, in, in each other's company. And there are varying levels, people who are more extroverted, people who are more introverted. But when we feel, sometimes we could have all the company in the world and we just feel alone. 
I need, Ya Allah, I want to be close to you. Ya Allah, I need your assistance. Go into sujood. The door is wide open. And if you can't go into sujood for whatever reason, make dua. It is a spiritual nearness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Wasjud waqtarib. Make sujood and come close. And become closer. And closer. And closer. And closer. And what does it mean to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his servant, as the Prophet says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man adali waliyan faqad adantuhu bil harb. Whoever opposes and shows hostility to one of my awliya, I declare war against him. Nas'alallah al-afiyah. May Allah give us adab with all of his creation and especially with those beloved to him. And you don't know who they are. Man adali waliyan faqad adantuhu bil harb. وَمَا يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَطُّهُ عَلَيْهِ And my servant draws closer to me with nothing more beloved to me than that which I have made an obligation upon him. وَلَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِ الْحَتَّ أُحِبَّ And my servant continues. يَتَقَرَّبْ 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 Drawing closer, 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 closer to me until what? Until I love him or I love her. That that servant is granted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Then what happens? If I love that servant, I become the hearing with which he hears. And the sight with which he sees. And the hand with which he strikes. And the leg with which he walks. And if he was to ask of me, I will surely grant him it. And if he was to seek refuge from me, I would surely grant him refuge. It's a, it's a sahih hadith. And it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to take care of that servant's affairs to such a degree that they are completely cared for by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does it mean to draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if that's the awliya, then what about the anbiya? The greatest of the awliya is still beneath the and you can't even say the least of the NBA because they're so they're they're so exalted in rank. That's the so what is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives those that he loves? And if the greatest of the awliya, that's any of the awliya, Allah grants them that if they're given their his love. What about Al Habib al A'zam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbi sallam? What about the greatest beloved sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi sahbi sallam? That's why they say. No one truly knows the rank of the Prophet Muhammad except himself. And obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because only an equal or a superior can know. And the Prophet within creation, he has no equal. And the only one who really knows him is his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَالَ عَزَّ وَجَدْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سِيمَاهُمْ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ مِنْ أَثَرِ السُّجُودِ that you can see the, the, their characteristics, their traits on their face, on their faces from the traces of their sujood. If I could just ask people to really squeeze in as much as possible, mashallah, try to make room for, for, for others uh, uh, to the extent of your ability. We're already, mashallah, quite, quite uh, closely packed in together, but please make room. Jazakumullah anna khayran. سِيمَاهُمْ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ مِنْ أَثَرِ السُّجُودِ You can see the traces, you can see their traits on their faces uh, from the traces of their sujood. And it's saying that this is nur al-khushur. This is the light of reverence that can be seen on their faces. And later we're going, going to talk about tahajjud. There are some of the awliya, they can specifically distinguish the light of tahajjud from other types of nur that comes from a person's iman. There was a, a, a student in Syria who was actually from Africa, but he would pray Qiyam al-Layl, and the shaykh would say, we can see this nur shining from his face because of his Qiyam al-Layl. سِمَاهُمْ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ مِنْ أَثَرِ السُّجُودِ You can see the effects of their sujood on their faces. And it's a radiance, a light, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them. La ilaha illallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa said that when a person, when Ibn Adam, a human being, 
uh, recites a verse of sujood and then makes the sujood, the shaitan secludes himself, runs away, and he says, Ya waylah, woe to me. This person, uh, uh, this person was commanded to prostrate, and he prostrated. So paradise is his. And I was commanded to prostrate, and I disobeyed. So I'm going to the fire. Every time a believer, when they recite an ayah of sujood in the Quran, they make sujood, the shaitan just remembers out the arrogance that prevented me from that. And how sujood is a sign of iman. That we are fulfilling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands and humbling ourselves for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيُرْوَى عَنْ عَلِي بْنِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ عَبَّاسِ أَنَّهُ كَانَ يَسْجُدُ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ أَلْفَ سَجْدَةِ وَكَانُوا يُسَمُّونَهُ السَّجَّادِ It's narrated that Ali bin Abdullah ibn al-Abbas. So al-Abbas is the Prophet's uncle. Abdullah ibn al-Abbas is his cousin. His son's name was Sayyidina Ali. That he would make sujood a thousand times a day. And they called him as sajjad And the Prophet sallallahu great-grandson, Sayyidina Ali Zain al-Abideen, he would do a thousand rak'ahs every day. That's why they call him Zain al-Abideen, the adornment of the worshippers, the beauty, the, the peak, the pristine one among all of the worshippers. Radiallahu anhu wa These people, they found honor in their sujood, honor in their ubudiyah. Naam. وكان يوسف بن أصباط يقول يا معشر الشباب بادروا بالصحة قبل المرض فما بقي أحد أحسده إلا رجل يتم ركوعه وسجوده وسجوده يوسف ابن أصباط one of the صالحين he would say oh young men and young people take advantage of your good health before sickness comes to you because there is no one that I envy except a person who is able to perform the ruku' and sujood fully. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was with David. We were in New York, and we met a man who has MS. He was in a wheelchair, and he literally started crying in front of us. He said, I miss the sujood. I can't do sujood anymore. He said, the thing that I miss the most in the salah, he said, I miss the sujood. Think about that. Take advantage of your good health and put it to good use. And when you exercise and when you take care of yourself, do it with the intention that it actually helps you in your ibadah. Your body is a vehicle that you need in order to perform these acts of worship. So when you take care of your body, take care of it with the intention that I want to have longevity in my salah. I want to pray properly and, and, and be able to perform all of the movements in the salah for the rest of my life, inshallah ta'ala, and enjoy the sujood. Realize what you're given in that sujood. And there are people who, they would give the world just to have that sujood again. قَالَ سَعِيدِ بْنُ جُبَيْرٍ مَا آسَى عَلَى شَيْءٍ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا عَلَى السُّجُودِ The only thing that I miss from the world, that I want in this world, is sujood. That's the only thing I want in this world. To be able to perform the sujood. وقال عقبة ابن مسلم ما من خصلة في العبد أحب إلى الله من رجل يحب لقاء الله. عقبة ابن مسلم he said, there is no characteristic in a servant that is more beloved to Allah than a man who loves to meet Allah. There is no characteristic more beloved to Allah than a person who loves to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do we cultivate that? How do we nurture that within ourselves? Because everyone is naturally has an aversion to death at various levels. It's natural. So how do you cultivate? How do you overcome that? Through sujood. How do you reach a state like many, many, many of the sahaba when Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu arda was on his deathbed and his wife was sad that he was about to die. Wa karba, wa karba. What a calamity. What a, what a terrible thing that's happening. And he said, Bal wa taraba. Now rather, what a celebration. What a joy. He said, what do you mean? 
غداً ألقى الأحبة Tomorrow I will be with my loved ones Muhammadan وصحبة Muhammadan his companions May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us at the moment that our souls are taken out of our body the greatest love and yearning to meet him Jalla Jalalu وَجَعَلْ خَيْرَ أَيَّامِنَا يَوْمًا الْقَاكِ يَا أَرْحَمَ الرَّاحِمِينَ نعم وَمَا مِنْ سَاعَةٍ الْعَبْدُ فِيهَا أَقْرَبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْهُ حَيْثُ يَخُرُّ سَاجِدًا And that there is no moment where a servant is closer to Allah than the moment that he prostrates into sujood. And Sayyidina Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه, he also said, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِذَا سَجَدْ the closest a servant is to Allah is when he or she performs sujood. فَأَكْثِرُ الدُّعَاءَ عِنْدَ ذَلِكْ So make abundant dua in sujood. Make abundant dua in sujood. The next section Imam al-Ghazali talks about is the merit of khushur. And now, we'll get, now we're going to an even deeper level of the inner dimension of the salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي and establish the prayer for my remembrance. So if you're not remembering Allah in the salah, have you really established it? Have you really performed the salah properly if it is void of remembrance? So that is an indication that you have to have khushur, your heart has to be present. You have to be experiencing the salah, the verses of the Quran, the, the various invocations in the salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse, وَلَا تَكُنْ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Do not be heedless. Do not be neglectful. And if that's generally, then what about in the salah? When you're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if you, if you, you know, even a family member, think, you know, someone that you love, imagine like a parent or someone who is a teacher or has, you know, serious rights over you. They're talking to you. And you just go, huh, huh, what, sorry, what'd you say? I wasn't listening. I'm talking to you, like, take it seriously. That's another human being, your, your parent or someone that you have to show that love and respect to and, and honor them. Then what about if you're in the salah? What, what surah was just recited? I can't remember. What rak'ah, ma'am? And it's not because you're overwhelmed with the intensity of the spiritual experiences. Oh, I was just... Yeah, I got to get a car wash and I got to go get some groceries and I got to respond to that email. That's the reason that I can't remember what, what. That's more important than the surah that was revealed that was just recited in the salah. من الغافلين. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تقرب الصلاة وأنتم سكارى حتى تعلموا ما تقولون. Do not approach the prayer when you are intoxicated until you know what you are saying. And some of the some of the salihin, especially the people of the spiritual path, they said that those who are intoxicated are people who are intoxicated with a lot of their worries and concerns, the endless list of things that I have to take care of. And it's also been said that they're intoxicated with love of the dunya. That's what's meant here by intoxicated. It also has the outward meaning as the uh, as the verses were revealed gradually to make. Uh, alcohol and intoxicants forbidden. But Imam al-Ghazali says, look here, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun, until you know what it is that you're saying. So he says, if you're in the salah, even if you never drank a drop of alcohol in your life, but you don't know what you're saying, you still fall into that second part of the, the ayah. So you're still drunk on something else that has prevented you from being aware of the words that you are reciting in the salah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, whoever prays two rak'ahs, lam yuhaddith nafsahu fihima, his nafs does not talk to him in those two rak'ahs about anything from the dunya, ghufira lahuma taqaddama min dhambih. All of his previous sins are forgiven. Two pure rak'ahs. When Imam al-Junaid was seen after he passed away, one of these great imams, one of the revivers of this deen, one of the, 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 the pillars of this deen, when he was seen after he died, he said, what did, Allah, what did Allah do with you? What happened? He said, all of the discourse and all of the, you know, the things that we thought were so important when we were in the world, he said, all of that just was like dust. He said, the thing that benefited me were two rak'ahs in the middle of the night. 
We can all do that. We can all do. We're not. None of us are going to be Imam and Junaid, but we can all pray two rak'ahs in the middle of the night. Find, put your phone away. Really focus your heart on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the things that tend to occupy your mind, direct them to Allah. Oh Allah, look at all these things that are occupying my mind. Oh Allah, look at all these things that are veiling me from you. I'm putting all of that at your door. I'm turning to you about all of these things. I am insufficient. I fall short. And you are most aware of that. And you are the only one who can help me. I place all of these things at your door. One of the things that we read today, My Lord, I seek your assistance in treating my heart, in healing my heart, and curing the ailments in my heart. So turn that into the salat. Two rak'ahs in the middle of the night. Um. La ilaha illallah. Um. This is really beautiful. وَرُوِيَ عَنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فِي الْكُتُبِ السَّالِفَةِ It's been narrated in previous scriptures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I do not accept the prayer of all who pray, but rather I accept the prayer of one who humbles himself to my majesty and is not arrogant with me and who feeds the needy and hungry person for my sake. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّمَا فُرِضَتِ الصَّلَاةُ وَأُمِرَ بِالْحَجِّ وَالطَّوَافِ وَأَشْعَرَةِ الْمَنَاسِكُ لِإِقَامَةِ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that prayer was made an obligation and we were commanded to hajj and circling around the Kaaba and the various rites of the pilgrimage. Why? In order to remember, to establish the remembrance of Allah the Exalted. That's the end of the hadith. So then Imam al-Ghazali says, فَإِذَا لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي قَلْبِكَ لِلْمَذْكُورِ الَّذِي هُوَ الْمَقْصُودُ وَالْمُبْتَغَى عَظَمَةٌ وَلَا هَيْبَةٌ فَمَا قِيمَةُ ذِكْرِكَ If the one, if there is nothing in your heart of uh, uh, exaltation and awe of the one being remembered who is the one who has actually sought through the remembrance, how valuable is your dhikr in the first place? If it's not emanating from a heart that has majesty and witnesses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's awe. In another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَإِذَا صَلَّيْتَ فَصَلِّ صَلَاتَ مُوَدِّعٍ If you pray, then pray a farewell prayer. Or rather, pray like a person who is bidding farewell. And Imam al-Ghazali says, he's bidding farewell to his own nafs. He's bidding farewell to his whims. He's bidding farewell to his lifespan. And he is traveling towards his Lord. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadahan famulaqi. O human being, you are toiling towards your Lord and you will eventually meet him. You will surely meet him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَن لَمْ تَنْهَهُ صَلَاتُهُ عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ لَمْ يَزْدَدْ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا بُعْدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَ عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ That the prayer prevents a person from a, a vile acts and things that are wrong and disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then sometimes people say, oh, I see all these people, they pray and doesn't stop them from that. The Prophet ﷺ said, if a person's prayer does not stop them from vile things and wrong actions, they do not increase in anything with Allah except distance from Him. Why? Because they've established the form of the salah, not the reality of the salah. As Imam al-Ghazali said that the salah is the, uh, uh, the pinnacle, the peak, Rasul qurubat we should, you know, when we have like a big gathering of dhikr and people are excited, there's a mawlid, there's a hadra, we should be excited about those things. We should be even more excited about salatul jama'ah. We have to adopt that frame of, of reference. 
what is Allah going to give in the salah? And all of those things, they're not mutually exclusive. They support one another. Your dhikr in the gathering helps you have more presence in the salah. Your presence in the salah helps you receive more from Allah in the gathering of dhikr and so forth. We're not trying to cut them and separate them. They're essentially one and the same. But we need to have that excitement about the fara'id, about the salah, about the sha'air, about these things, so that we experience the reality of the salah. And when we leave the salah, we feel that transformation, that nur, that sakina that we feel in the gathering of dhikr. We should. Or something's missing. Naam. قال بكر بن عبد الله يا ابن آدم إذا شئت أن تدخل على مولاك بغير إذن دخلت He says, O son of Adam, if you want to enter upon your Lord without permission, you can do so, you can enter. And they said, how is that? He said that you perform wudu completely and you enter your mihrab, your prayer niche. And if you enter, فَإِذَا أَنْتَ قَدْ دَخَلْتَ عَلَى مَوْلَاكَ If you do that, then you have entered into the presence of your Lord. بِغَيْرِ إِذْنٍ Without any previous formal permission slip. فَتُكَلِّمُهُ بِغَيْرِ تُرْجُمَانٍ And you speak to him without a translator. Direct. Sayyidah Aisha رضي الله عنها She said the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم He would speak to us and we would speak to him. But when the time for prayer came فَكَأَنَّهُ لَمْ يَعْرِفْنَا وَلَمْ نَعْرِفْهَ it was as if he didn't know us and we didn't know him. There was nothing in the world more important to him in that moment than responding to his Lord's call. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> it's narrated that Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, when he would pray, Sumi'a wajibu qalbihi ala milayn. People could hear his heart palpitations from two miles away. When he would enter into salah, his heartbeat would be so intense and loud standing in the presence of Allah that people could hear it from two miles away. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah does not gaze upon a person in his prayer if the man does not have his heart present with his body. The movements are not enough if the heart is not present. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw a man who was يَعْبَثُ بِلَحْيَتِهِ Just kind of like playing around with his beard in the salah. You know, kind of doing this in the salah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَوْ خَشَعَ قَلْبُ هَذَا لَخَشَعَ الْجَوَارِحَ If his heart had reverence and khushur, his limbs would follow suit and would be in a state of khushur as well. You can't be like, oh, my heart is in the presence of Allah. You would be like, you would be, it would impact your body. Right? So that we have to have sakina in our salah. We have to have adab in our salah. And when we force ourselves at the beginning, then it helps our heart. And then when our, our heart has presence, it then affects our limbs. And it's kind of a directly proportional relationship. There's many, many other statements. Uh, I will just try to mention uh, a few more. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. It's narrated that Muslim Ibn Yasar, one of the pious predecessors, he was praying in one of the masajid in Basra, in Iraq. So there was an entire wing of the masjid, an entire area of the masjid collapsed while he was praying. So all these people came and, and after he was done with the prayer, he, he didn't even know that it had happened. He hadn't even heard it or noticed it happening because of his khushur in the salah. There are many stories. Like that, the Sahaba, one of the Sahaba had to have a, his leg amputated. What, what are we going to do? He said, cut it off when I, while I'm in salah. And then he, they, he prayed, and when he was done with the salah, he said, did you cut it off? Not qulub ardiyya. They had hearts that were celestial, not worldly hearts. Their hearts were in the highest heavens. Their hearts were connected, attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne. Now, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, when he would enter the prayer, this was the description, that uh, he would start to shake and his color would change. And they would say to him, what's wrong, O commander of the believers? We're seeing you in this very intense, this intense fear. And he would say, 
جاء وقت أمانة عرضها الله على السماوات والأرض. The time has come for the trust that Allah presented to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they were fearful of it. Uh, and they refused to take it and were fearful of it, and I have taken it on. I have taken on that trust, indicating the salah and that he's the imam of the time and of the salah. Anhu wa arda. His grandson, the Prophet's great-grandson, Sayyidina Ali ibn Hussein, it is said that when he would make wudu, he would become yellow, his face would change color, and his family would say to him, why is it that this happens to you when you make wudu? And he would say, do you know before whom I am about to stand? Do you know who it is before whom I'm about to stand? Not just, this wasn't like a nice thing that they said. Like, I want to remind you of the importance of, that was their lived experience. Radiyallahu anhum wa ardahum ajma'een. I'll just and end with this, inshallah ta'ala. The, uh, the reflection session this morning, which was really beautiful, we read the statement of Hatim al-Asam. And Sheikh Yahya, just to uh, complete what he said, he said that we would cover the rest of the statement in the session, and we'll do that, and we'll end with that, inshallah ta'ala. That Hatim al-Asam, one of the pious predecessors, may Allah be well pleased with him, he was asked about his salah. He said, when the time for salah comes, I perform wudu completely and I do it well. And I come to the place where I intend to pray. So I sit there until I become fully collected. My body is fully collected and I'm at, in a state of tranquility and, and, and ease and calmness. Then I rise to my prayer and I put the Kaaba before my very eyes. And I put the Sirat, the traverse over hellfire at my feet. That it's as if it's right before me and I have to cross over it. And paradise is on my right, and the hellfire is to my left, and the angel of death is standing behind me. And I think that it will be my last prayer. Then I stand and pray, and I'm in a state between hope and fear. And then I say, Allahu Akbar, uh, uh, with, with reverence. And I recite the Quran properly with tartil honoring the Qur'an, revering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words, tasting the Qur'an, loving the Qur'an, being impacted by the Qur'an. Then I make a ruku' with humility, and I prostrate with reverential fear, and I sit in between the two prostrations, and I perform it properly with the tawarruk and so forth. And uh, uh, and following all of that and included in all of that is sincerity. And then after I'm done, I don't know, has it been accepted from me or not? So we have to have presence of heart. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn al-Abbas radiallahu anhu he said, two rak'ahs where a person is reflecting and pondering upon the Qur'an and the meanings of the salah are better than standing the entire night in prayer with a heart that is heedless. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the realities of sujood. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrect us with Sayyidul Sajideen, Zayn al-Wujood, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, under the banner of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. May Allah give us the tawfiq to perform abundant sujood and abundant prayers and that he makes the prayer the coolness of our eyes and the greatest joy in our lives and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us presence of heart and reverence and khushur so that we benefit from the realities of the salah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us sujood al-qalb something called the prostration of the heart one of the knowers of Allah was asked, he said, does the heart have a prostration? He says, yes, the heart does have a sujood. But with the sujood of the heart, it's a little bit different. When the heart finally goes into sujood, it never rises again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us sujood al-qalb. 
and, and all of the benefits of the, the salah and following Al Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam inwardly and outwardly. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.